Um, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Oh, that fell already. Um, my name is Robin Warner. Uh, I'm, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Python and how it can be used to measure portfolio diversification. Just as a quick background on myself, I currently work um, at the University of Toronto Asset Management Corporation, um, or short for UTAM. Um, we at UTAM are responsible actually for managing the endowment, uh, the pension plan, and the uh, short-term working capital funds for the University of Toronto. Um, and I work on a niche team there called the Risk and Research Group. Um, before we actually get started, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to two people who were actually pretty instrumental in uh, putting this presentation together with me. Uh, one is uh, uh, Doug Cho. He is our CRO at UTEM, and he helped kind of um, simplify some of the math components that we're going to be seeing um, and some of the theory as well. And secondly, I'd just like to say thanks to a good friend of mine, Tegan Schultz, who uh, helped me clean up the code just for readability for this presentation. So uh, thank you, Doug and Tegan. Uh, as pres uh, previously stated, today I'm going to talk to you about the term diversification and its specific applications within finance or um, in portfolio construction and investment risk management. Um, as a, qu a quick agenda, we're just going to start by introducing some key terms um, and what is actually meant by diversification, just so that we're all on the same page when we actually look at the code and look at the data. After that, we are going to jump into some code and look at the data set and define as well our problem space that we're going to run our analysis on. Um, after that, we're going to uh, look at various ways to quantify uh, portfolio diversification, and we're going to talk about the uh, strengths and shortcomings of each of those met methods and uh, metrics that we end up developing. And finally, we're just going to, if we have enough time, we'll uh, kind of look at some extensions or further applications that you can use this in, as well as uh, some of the resources that was used for the presentation. Um, so let's get started with some background theory. The first concept we're going to define is an investment. Um, an investment is defined as an asset or item acquired with the goal of generating a profit over time. Examples of investments can be something like, well, most popular, like a publi uh, publicly uh, company stock, or a government bond, or foreign currency, commodity futures, even real estate. Um, in our case, it doesn't really matter what it is, but just know that an investment has a specific purpose. As well as a specific purpose, I think it decided to freeze on me. That is, there you go. Um, as well as a specific purpose, an investment also has a lifespan. What is that lifespan? Well, first, what we have to do is we actually have to acquire that investment. That investment is acquired today based on expectations that we have of the future. Once we get that investment, well, um, holding it, it begins the process of accumulating some sort of gain or loss uh, based on market movements. After that, at the very end of the life cycle of this investment, we redeem it and hopefully co collect some sort of profit from it. What is required to invest? Well, we touched on it previously. Um, it is an, some sort of idea of what's going on in the future and particularly what rewards that future might hold. Uh, more specifically, we need an expectation of future changes in the value of the investment, which we're going to define as the investment's expected return. So what's the problem? Well, the future is uncertain, and expectations are just that, expectations. So therefore, there exists a risk that our investments realize returns differ greatly from what we expected. So looking again at what we require to invest, uh, we need, obviously, as we said before, expectations of the future or the investment's expected return, but we also need some sort of measure of how wrong we may be about that investment's future and how we see it. And this we're going to define as the investment's risk. With that being said, how exactly can we quantify these two measures or estimate them? Well, for expected return, uh, the harder of the two to uh, estimate, uh, there are a ver like, variety of techniques they could do. Uh, some can range from simple averages of previously observed returns uh, to complex models that are based on the cash flows that that investment might generate during its lifespan. Uh, for risk, most techniques involve some sort of measure of dispersion. Um, particularly observed historical dispersion. But what's important to note in all this is that, like I said, there exists numerous uh, models for each of these. You can, uh, for this, uh, this presentation, you can substitute any of these models for what we're about to use, which is namely the historical average and the historical volatility. 
How are we going to define those? Uh, essentially, we're going to simplify it and just take the five-year average monthly return uh, for the expected return of the investment. And for the risk, we're going to take that uh, investment's historical volatility uh, based on a five-year average time span. This is also known as the standard deviation. Now that we have that, what is a portfolio? Well, a portfolio is a collection of investments that, when uh, bundled together, provide its owner with a return on their invested capital. As depicted in this diagram, um, a portfolio sits atop of a hierarchy above its individual investments. Um, it inherits from each investment that investment's risk and return characteristics. However, it also inherits um, something more, which is uh, defined here as emergent properties. Essentially, what you're inheriting is not only that investment's risk and return characteristics, but also the relationship that each of those investments have between each other. So, as we talked about there, what is then a portfolio's expected return? Well, the expected re return of a portfolio is a function of the returns, which we defined before, of its individual investments, as well as the respective allocation or weights within the portfolio. This function may be expressed as follows, which is essentially just the sum product between two vectors, wi and e r subscript i. wi is the weights vector, which is essentially defined as uh, the percentage of the total portfolio that that investment re represents within it. And our subscript I was that return that we estimated. It's a 30 minute talk. Oh, it's a 30 minute talk. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Heart attack there. <laughs> <laughs> um, now let's actually look at the portfolio's risk. For the volatility of the portfolio, or its risk, is also a function of the weights and individual uh, uh, returns, or uh, sorry, individual risk of its investments. Um, it's denoted in this kind of complicated looking function, but really what you should see here is just two terms. You see that wi, sigma i term, which is wi being the weights, again, as we defined, and sigma i being those risks or volatilities of the in, uh, investment's returns. However, um, we also have this new term right here, rho ij, which is the correlation between uh, those uh, individual investments. And that right there is an example of an emergent property that actually appears on the portfolio level. So now that we have an idea of our or a definition of, of a portfolio's risk and return, when managing a portfolio of investments, how does one balance the trade-off between the two? Well, you don't. Instead, the idea is to view both simultaneously through the view of efficiency. What do I mean by that? Well, portfolio of eff efficiency is a measure of how much re reward a portfolio may produce for every unit of risk taken. Uh, it is defined as the ratio between the portfolio's expected return and its volatility. The higher this ratio, the more return the portfolio is expected to generate for a given risk level, and thus the more efficient that portfolio is deemed to be. Now, I know that was a lot. <laughs> we're finally getting to the crux of what I wanted to talk about today, which is diversification. Given everything that we just learned um, and all that terminology actually under our belts, let's define what we mean by that. Well, a technical definition is that it is a risk management technique that aims to minimize the impact of any single investment's performance on that of the total portfolio. Put simply, this is analogous to dividing our eggs among numerous baskets so that if we are to drop one egg or one basket, the whole portfolio won't suffer from that. As portfolio management is focused on efficiency, and we've just de defined diversification as a tool portfolio managers can use to work on that efficiency, uh, what we would like to answer is the following. How can one use diversification to achieve an efficient portfolio? Finally, we're going to get to some code and some data. So in order to answer that, let's look at our data set and our problem space. But before that, uh, we have seen Pandas in a lot of the uh, previous talks. Just want to give a quick overview of it, uh, pr particularly because it's going to play a pretty essential role in the rest coming up. Um, what is Pandas? Essentially, it is a po popular Python library used for data manipulation and analysis. It was developed by Wes McKinney in the late 2000s, I believe, um, while he was working for the firm uh, AQR Capital Management, which is a hedge fund based out of New York. Uh, after McKinney actually left AQR, he managed to convince them to open up the code for Pandas, and thus Pandas was able to become what it is today. Central to Pandas is the data frame. As we already seen, the, the data frame object is 
um, a table object that has a lot of useful characteristics or useful functionality based around it. Essentially, you have the ability to do charts, you have the ability to do statistical analysis, you have the ability to group by higher, hierarchical indexes, or even then pivot on those indexes as well. Um, for our purpose, what we're going to be looking at is uh, using these, uh, these table objects or these data frames and building superstructures on top of that that are basically collections of data frames. If these objects get a little bit too abstract, just think of the objects as collections of tables, and we'll be charting those later on. The data, what are we going to use? We'll be using return data from arguably the most famous uh, stock market index in the world, the Standard & Poor's S&P 500. <laughs> Sorry, the S&P 500. Uh, the main reason for using the S&P 500 is due to it being just so rich in, uh, and so available in terms of historical data. Um, however, I want to take a moment to note that this analysis, uh, basically you could use any sort of asset to, uh, and perform the same sort of analysis on those assets, be it, like we said before, government bonds, foreign currency, Bitcoin, if you like. Um, all that's really required of this asset is that it has some sort of return set. If it has a return set, you could substitute that in and we'll be able to do the same analysis from there. With that being said, let's look at how we're going to do this. Well, first, our actual data. The data right, that you, that's shown here is just a ginormous table. Uh, it's 500 stocks, so therefore we have 500 columns, and we have 60 date rows, each uh, representing a month between January 2013 and December 2017, five years' worth of data. Each of the cells uh, are basically the percentage return of that individual stock for that month. Um, this data frame is actually what we're going to, well, more, we're going to import this data into a data frame, and that will be the raw data frame that we use going forward and build all of our objects on top of it. For this analysis and setup process, what we're going to do is we're going to build an object known as the investment universe. Um, step one, we'll transform our raw data into this investment universe, which is defined as a collection of investable instruments and their individual characteristics. Step two, we'll use the portfolio generator function to randomly sample that investment universe uh, created in step one with the goal of, of building paper portfolios that will be analyzed later on. Step three will be to then collect all of these paper portfolios and build a portfolio universe so that we can have or collect all of the metrics for those portfolios. So let's look at how this is done. A lot of code, probably not readable in the back. Um, all I want to point out is that uh, what we're doing is we're taking that previous data frame that we had with returns and we're using pandas' built-in methods to create methods of our own for the investment universe. For example, you can see here there's two investment characteristics, the expected returns and the volatilities. How did we c compute that? Well, essentially we just used this nifty little mean and li nifty little STD uh, method, which standard deviation, to just create that. Now that we have this going forward, we'll be able to call upon it for uh, the next objects that come through this. Um, after this, we have our portfolio generator function. Um, our portfolio generator function takes three inputs. Uh, it requires an investment universe, previously seen, a position list, or that's going to be a list of integers that we have that is going to dictate how many random uh, investments are we choosing for each portfolio, as well as a number of simulations, which is more how many of these portfolio sizes are we going to choose. Um, in our case, we actually uh, gave a portfolio list of 14 different sizes, and we asked for 400 simulations of each. Therefore, we're going to be generating 5,600 portfolios to run our analysis on. Um, as far as all this code, really all I want to draw attention to is this guy right here. This is the one line of code that is embedded in this egregious use of for loops um, that is essentially uh, taking advantage of the random library and particularly the sample function within that random library. What does it output? Well, it outputs a matrix of zeros and ones with each column representing a portfolio and each row an investment. Should a cell be tagged as a one instead of a zero, we know that that investment is actually included within the portfolio. 
For step three now, the portfolio universe uh, takes that same metric and builds the portfolio, um, sorry, and computes the various characteristics needed for our analysis. Uh, most importantly, the portfolio universe actually computes the weights. Uh, just as a quick note, we're going to be equally weighting all of our portfolios. Thus, none of the actual individual investments are going to have more importance than an, another investment in that portfolio. So everything is equal. Here are a few other examples of some of the metrics that we're going to be calculating. As you can see at the top, we have the expected return of the portfolio. We have the variance, the volatility. These are all going to be used for downstream processes. Uh, but as you, as you can note, all they're taking as inputs are that portfolio weight, which we just saw, and the investment universe, because we're now going to leverage some of those methods that we built in the investment universe. Final output of everything we just did is a data frame that has all of these portfolio metrics along the columns and all of these portfolios along the rows. We can now start looking at what we're doing. But before, quick recap, what exactly are we doing? Well, we're trying to answer this question is how can one use diversification to achieve an efficient portfolio? To do that, let's now look at some diversification metrics. For, as a start, what we're going to do is we're going to see what happens to our portfolio as you just increase the number of positions. We know that diversification has something to do with how many positions that that portfolio holds. So let's see what happens to the risk and return pro uh, profiles of those portfolios. For expected return, uh, for this chart, what you're seeing is uh, expected return or um, Risk, oh yeah, sorry, expected return on the y-axis, and you're seeing number of positions on the x-axis. The red and orange line uh, represent the uh, mean and median portfolio by expected return, uh, while the blue and green lines represent the uh, bottom and top quartiles, respectively. As we can see, as you increase the number of positions in a portfolio, the return of the portfolio converges to that of the total universe. Why? We're just running out of, out of uh, securities or unique securities to actual sample from. Uh, one interesting thing to note is just how quickly the mean and median actually converge to that universe uh, mean and median, um, while the tails take a little bit more time to do so. Here is the same chart, but this is looking at risk or volatilities on the y-axis. This chart tells a very different story. Where expected return was somewhat flat for the whole thing, we're seeing that volatilities drops fast. It drops um, and at of diminishing marginal rates, but it drops incredibly fast. Um, looking at both simultaneously, uh, we get a good feeling of, and okay, let me explain this quickly. This is a scatter plot. We have volatilities on the x-axis, and we have expected returns on the y-axis. What you're seeing here, too, for colors, is any of those darker points, those are portfolios with less positions, while anything lighter or warmer act is actually where we increase the position size. What ends up happening is we see that the portfolios start to clump around a certain uh, section, which that right there being the universe uh, expected return. What we could draw on here is what is known in um, finance as the efficient frontier. Uh, essentially, this, these are the portfolios with the highest efficiency ratios or risk-adjusted returns, anything that lies on that. Seeing this, what happens to a portfolio efficiency as you increase the number of uh, investments? Well, it goes up. We see that here. However, two observations. Yes, as the number of investments increase, portfolio efficiency increase, increases. However, it does so at a diminishing marginal uh, rate. Um, because of that, there's actually a practical side that we need to consider here. Uh, though we could gain more diversification in this portfolio by just simply buying more individual investments, uh, there is a lim limit. And this limit is actually hit a lot more quickly uh, when we take into account, uh, like, management costs, portfolio management costs and transaction costs for, that are involved in managing a portfolio of a lot of instruments. Therefore, what we know is that there exists some sort of relationship between diversification and efficiency, and therefore there also exists some sort of optimal efficiency. How can we find that? Well, let's look at the efficiency ratio again. We saw that those charts before show that kind of diversification doesn't really hit this portion or this term of it. In fact, all it does is hit volatility. In fact, it lowers it and thus increasing efficiency. Looking at portfolio volatility, or in this case, portfolio variance, um, this, second, this first term right here also 
is it really hits by diversification? Because there are no relationships between each of those individual investments. In fact, those are just the sum products of the weights and volatilities of the individual investments. However, what we do notice is this term again, that's the correlation term. That is our emergent properties. And when looking at diversification and developing diversification metrics, that's the term that we're going to focus on and see what happens. So for diversification metrics, we're going to look at three uh, metrics today. Uh, the first being the diversification ratio, the second being the average correlation, and the third being the diversification index. Uh, first, let's look at the diversification ratio. Um, as we saw, right here is volatility of a portfolio. What we do for the idea behind uh, the diversification ratio is actually to take our correlation and just set it equal to one. Doing so, uh, makes it, it creates the idea that we have the most undiversified portfolio as possible. In fact, what's happening here is every time a stock goes up, all of the other stocks goes, down, uh, goes up as well. The opposite is true. Every time a stock goes down, every single other one goes down as well. What we then do, well, first, setting it to one actually simplifies that horrible equation into something a lot more manageable. And what we do is we take this guy, we define it as the under, undiversified portfolio volatility, and we use that as the numerator in this ratio, which is simply that guy divided by our original portfolio volatility. In Python, one way of uh, applying this or implementing it is using what we previously made and just simple return, uh, simple div division of the data frames. This diversification ratio has some interesting properties. One is as it approaches one, uh, the portfolio in question actually has very little diversification. As it approaches or gets greater than one, um, the greater being the better, we actually know that this portfolio is more diversified. In chart form, on the x-axis, we see the diversification ratio. On uh, the y-axis, we see the efficiency ratio. And you can see here that there's a clear trend that kind of appears. One is, as you increase your diversification, denoted by the diversification ratio, we also increase our efficiency. However, I do want to point out something, is that if you look above the warm color, which is our, most, our portfolios with the most positions in them, you can see some darker colors above that. Those represent portfolios that have managed to basically reach the same efficiency as our 400 plus portfolios, but have done so using less positions. So in some ways, those are actually more cost effective portfolios. This is just showing clearly that there's an uptrend. Our second metric is going to be portfolio average cor correlation. Where we set this to one before, we're actually going to solve for a single row um, that will hold the volatility constant. That complicated, uh, or more what seems to be a complex solution, actually simplifies to something a little, a ratio that's a little bit uh, easy to understand. Uh, namely, it's a ratio that only takes uh, three unique terms, portfolio variance, which we already know what it is, undiversified portfolio variance, which is equivalent to what we looked at before, and this uh, first term of the portfolio variance function. In Python, this is how I chose to implement it. Again, that's not necessarily uh, the best way, but it's an efficient way because of our uh, objects that contain multiple uh, data frames. The properties of the portfolio average correlation is that as our average correlation approaches one, particularly the absolute value of that average correlation, uh, our portfolio, we know that our portfolio has little diversification properties. As it approaches zero, it actually approaches the most optimum uh, diversification it could get. Uh, I want to take a quick side to note, because I have had a lot of conversations with people about this metric, in which they say, wait, shouldn't negative one be what you're striving for? Again, if we think of it on variance terms, yes, negative one will probably make your portfolio volatility and variance limit out at zero. However, think of what's going to happen to your returns. Those are also going to cancel out because, again, we're going to get that simultaneously different movements that every gain is offset by another loss. So thus, our actual efficiency ratio is the worst in this case. If we look at this one in the same sort of scatter plot function, we see that an ellipsoid is for firmed, uh, formed sorry, around the 0.2 value for average correlation. Um, with, again, some darker uh, portfolios appearing above our maximum position portfolios. If we trace out a curve, this is where we would expect the best portfolios to lie. In fact, we want anything that is at the near at the top of that uh, arc. Now that we have two diversification ratios under our belt, let's just 
since they're both looking at correlation, make sure that they're actually telling the same thing um, and the same story. This is probably one of my favorite uh, charts of the, of the presentation. Uh, essentially, what you're looking at here is a clustering that ends up happening between these two metrics. What we have here is the diversification ratio that we looked at on the x-axis. We have the average correlation uh, ratio on, not ratio, but average correlation value on the y-axis. What you should notice is that we get clustering that happens uh, with downward sloping groups, and that downward slope basically flattens out. But not only that, the dispersion of that group shrinks as well. Just to kind of make that clearer, these red lines kind of show the trend. Um, portfolios, one thing that's also nice about this chart is that we can see that portfolios with the highest efficiency actually lie in a very specific uh, portion of these clusters. They're the portfolios that lie at the bottom right of each of these. And those are the ones that we want to look into and potentially buy if we're looking to uh, maximize our efficiency. The last uh, metric I want to look at today is something called the diversification index. Uh, what we need to do, though, is kind of take a step back and actually look at uh, portfolio volatility in uh, matrix form. For those of you who remember your linear algebra, what we're looking at here is essentially W being the transpose of the weights vector. Uh, that would be the weights vector itself. And this capital sigma being the covariance matrix of that portfolio. Uh, what we're going to use um, or look at is that core forward matrix, and we're going to use a statistical technique called principal component analysis to decompose that into uh, various independent factors. I don't know how many of you are familiar with PCA, so we're just going to do a quick primer. Uh, this is a very big simplification of what it is. But in short, uh, PCA is a dimension reduction technique. Um, it is a quant quantitative way of taking something that is very complex and simplifying it into manageable bytes. Uh, the PCA process, what it does is it takes original data, it does its PCA jargon, and puts out two uh, outputs. One being uh, the independent linear combinations or principal components of our matrix, and the other being this vector of principal component relative strengths. Uh, for those of you, again, who remember your linear algebra, this vector is actually a vector of eigenvalues sorted by uh, their explanation of variance. A lot of terminology. It's very esoteric. Don't worry about it. <laughs> what is the code? This is the code that we used. Uh, again, let's just point out we're using scikit-learn, uh, scikit-learn being a uh, very useful machine learning uh, library. We're using the PCA object from there and pulling out the explained variance ratio. Um, so what exactly is the diversification index? Well. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is, again, the sum product between two vectors, the first vector being that uh, principal component vector that we were talking about, or the explain explanation of principal components, um, and the other one being uh, the index of that actual uh, principal component vectors. Um, how we implement it is just, again, because this is fairly simple, is in this way. The esotericness. Uh, kind of translates into a, a very easy or simple um, interpretation of it. The properties being, um, as this index approaches one, we actually know that that portfolio has little, very little diversification. In fact, if we're looking at this in terms of number of bets or active bets, you're really only taking one bet on the market. However, as that uh, index approaches n, which is the number of positions within the portfolio, you are approaching maximum diversification, where each position in that portfolio actually represents a unique orthogonal bet to the rest of the portfolio. So we're looking at things that are higher up in n. What does the scatter plot of this one look? Well, this one kind of turns into something a little bit more elegant or easily interpretable. Uh, what we want to look at here, again, diversification being on the x axis, uh, sorry, diversification index being on the x axis, and risk adjusted returns or efficiency on the y. Uh, what we want to look at is this maximum efficiency that we see that the, that the system actually converges to. Uh, this line right here, which is around just below the 0.5 mark, is usually what you, if you're paying to buy a lot more positions in the S&P 500, that is the most efficiency you'll be able to buy. However, you can actually buy that efficiency with a lot cheaper portfolios, namely portfolios that are in this dark range. In fact, you can buy portfolios that are even more efficient than that. 
Um, so this, is, this again is an idea of just from the cost perspective and management perspective, you can uh, basically provide for your client um, a better, or for yourself, a better portfolio. Just as a quick recap, we looked at these three metrics, uh, the diversification ratio, the average correlation, these two actually both manipulating that correlation part and showing a pretty interesting relationship between the two. And we looked, looked at the diversification index. Uh, though different in approach, each metric showed the benefit uh, diversification brings to the portfolio of efficiency, while also showing uh, the diminishing marginal benefit of diversification, uh, particularly when measured against like, portfolio management costs. I want to, I have some applications and for, for the research, uh, resources that we could look at, but I also want to provide, just in case anybody has questions, um, I want to provide the chance to look at them. These are kind of the four applications I was going to talk about. Uh, index replication being um, how actual uh, portfolio managers will replicate a certain stock market index in a very cheap way. Uh, Factor-based investing is to actually take those orthogonal vectors, translate them or rotate them into some sort of direction that we can understand, be it, say, the direction of a currency of return, uh, sorry, a return for currencies or uh, a return that emulates the, te te uh, the technology companies in the United States. Um, or uh, risk decomposition can, again, be opening up that portfolio volatility and looking at how do the, each of those vectors change through time. Um, and then the last thing being performance attribution, which is decomposing your dollar amount that you make, the dollar profit that you make, and finding exactly what made that dollar profit. Um, as a quick aside, these were the resources that we use. Pandas, Scikit-Learn was used there. Matplotlib was used for those fancy charts. We didn't actually use that uh, directly. We just used it natively in Pandas. Um, and just for your guys' benefit, if you want to read up on some of the theory that this is based on, uh, I have here three uh, papers that um, actually touch upon it and do so in a very good way. Anyways, thank you very much for sitting through that uh, presentation. And please, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. Thank you, Robin. Uh, do we have any questions in the room for Robin? Oh. Coming up. Quick question. Uh, for the diversification index, was that the first principal component of that big covariant matrix? So we actually don't touch the principal component at all. The, we take our principal component, usually so, that's a good question, because usually in PCA, what you, do, what you care about is that principal component output. We actually just disregard that. We look at just the eigenvalues. Because essentially, the eigenvalues can actually translate into an explanation of how uh, the weighting scheme of each of those principal components, uh, or more, they translate into weights, explaining what portion of the variance each principal component explains of the total. So we actually care about that weight factor, which is the eigenvalues. Did, did that answer you, uh, the question? Okay. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you, Robin. Thank you, guys.